When it comes to performing any engine tuning, the dyno is the best place to perform this tuning because you're getting instant feedback from the dyno in terms of power and torque numbers regarding the changes that you're making. However, while we're using a dyno, we still need to understand the best way to use the dyno in order to get the best results for your particular tuning task. What I see a lot of tuners do is only perform a handful of wide open throttle ramp run tunes when they're running a car on the dyno. Now this may make perfect sense if for example you're tuning a drag car that's only going to spend its life running at wide open throttle. However, for a street car or a circuit car, both of these engines will spend a lot of time at part throttle and under transient conditions, and simply performing a handful of wide open throttle ramp runs will not do anything to address that part throttle area of the map. In order to deal with this, what we're going to need is what's referred to as a load bearing dyno. Now this is a type of dyno that has what's referred to as a power absorber module, which is used to apply a variable amount of load either to the rollers, if we're talking about a rolling road dyno, or in the case of our mainline Pro Hub dyno here, we've got a pair of eddy current power absorbers that apply load to the rear hubs directly. The load bearing dyno differs quite dramatically from the other type of dyno that's popular for aftermarket tuning, which is referred to as an inertia dyno. An inertia dyno doesn't have a power absorber module, and generally these types of dyno will use one large diameter heavy roller that the car sits on top of. Because the diameter of the roller as well as the weight of the roller is known, by measuring the rate of acceleration of the roller as the car performs a wide open throttle ramp run, the power that the engine is producing can be calculated. The problem with the inertia dyno is that while they're great at performing wide open throttle ramp runs and giving us power and torque figures, they don't have that power absorber module so we can't perform steady state tuning. This means they're no use to us for tuning the part throttle areas of the map. Now I've just added another term in there, steady state, and this is what we're going to be doing when we're tuning the part throttle areas of the map. Essentially what we're doing is using the power absorber on our dyno to apply a variable amount of load to the wheels, or the hubs in our case, and this will allow us to maintain a fixed road speed, which in turn, through a manual transmission, means that we also have a fixed engine RPM. What this means is that from the driver's seat we can now set the dyno to maintain a fixed engine RPM and as we increase our throttle opening and the engine produces more power and torque, the dyno is simply going to apply more load to the wheels in order to hold that RPM constant. Particularly with aftermarket standalone ECUs, this allows us to very accurately access each of the individual fuel and ignition cells in our map and tune each of those and optimise them individually. If we take our time and do this properly, it's going to mean that regardless of whereabouts the driver is in terms of throttle position and the engine RPM out on the road or the racetrack, we're going to know that the air fuel ratio will be correct and we're going to know that the ignition timing is also optimal. Even with a dyno that's capable of performing steady state tuning, we're not going to use that mode of operation to tune the entire fuel and ignition map. Instead, what we're trying to do is choose the mode of dyno operation to best match the way the engine is actually going to be operating out on the road or the racetrack. For example, if we're in third or fourth gear at 40 to 50 percent throttle, then the engine RPM is probably going to be relatively consistent or slowly accelerating. So we would understand understandably perform steady state tuning to help tune these areas of the map. When we go to wide open throttle though, now hopefully the car's going to be accelerating pretty quickly with all of that power and torque coming out of our engine, so it wouldn't make a lot of sense for us to steady state tune those areas of the map because the engine RPM will be constantly increasing when we're at wide open throttle. With this in mind, we're going to be using ramp runs on the dyno to replicate those areas of the map. Particularly when faced with a freshly installed ECU with absolutely no base map, performing our steady state tuning to start with 
can help us build up our fuel and ignition tables without placing the engine under any undue stress or strain. What this means is that as we increase our throttle opening or our RPM and move out into those untuned areas, we're already going to be really close to the ballpark, giving us less work to do dialing in the fuel and ignition numbers, and it's also going to mean that we're putting no more stress on our engine than we absolutely need to. So we can see how all of this pans out. We're going to jump on the dyno in a second and have a look at some steady state churning as well as some wide open throttle ramp runs. The car that we're going to be using for this demonstration is a Porsche 996 GT3 Cup car, but this particular 996 is a little unique in that it's been fitted with a Mast Motorsport 7 litre LS7 coupled up to a Hollinger 6 speed paddle shifted transaxle. While this combination is certain to annoy a few of the Porsche purists out there, the car has been built with reliability and power in mind, being that it competes here in New Zealand in the South Island Endurance Racing Championship. Let's jump on the dyno and we'll get started. To start with, we want to select the gear that we're going to run the car in. There isn't a fixed gear that we must use. Generally, we're trading off the torque being produced at the hubs versus the hub speed that we're going to need to operate at. I like to start by choosing a gear that's round about one to one, and in this case, we're using fifth gear in the Hollinger transaxle. Once we've selected our gear, we can get the car up and running on the dyno. And generally when we're getting started, we'd want to start at as low a RPM as we can start to load up the car, perhaps around 1500 to 2000 RPM. In this case, we've already got some of the tuning done, so we're going to jump up a little bit in the RPM, and we're going to get started here at 3000 RPM. Once we've got the dyno controlling the car at 3000 RPM, the RPM is now not going to fluctuate. And what we can do is move up and down our fuel table using the throttle pedal. As we open the throttle, the engine produces more power and torque, but of course the eddy current power absorbers simply apply more load to the rear hubs in order to keep that engine RPM constant. Now that the dyno is actually controlling the engine RPM, we can concentrate on our job, which is tuning the fuel and ignition cells. In this case, we'll take a quick look at the fuel table in the Motec M150. And here, there's a little bit of functionality within the M1 ECU that makes our job really easy. The ECU takes input from two two wideband air fuel ratio sensors, one fitted in each bank of the LS7 V8. This information comes into the M1 tuning software, and then in order to make tuning changes, we can simply use the Quick Lambda key, which can be functioned by pressing the Q key on the laptop keyboard in order to automatically correct the air fuel ratio and get it onto our target. This makes our tuning really quick and easy because we don't need to sit in each individual cell for a long period of time. All we need to do is apply a little bit more throttle, move into the next untuned site, wait until the air fuel ratio data is stable, press the Q key to apply that quick lambda and correct our fueling, check that it is in fact correct, and then we can increase our throttle and tune the next cell. Now in this way we can tune our fueling in no more than about 10 or 15 seconds for a particular RPM range. Again this is helpful because it means that we're not putting a lot of stress and a lot of heat into the engine. This becomes particularly important as we get into the higher RPM ranges. With the Motec M150 we are also using closed loop air fuel ratio control. So this again just helps us make sure that the engine is running the correct air fuel ratio and we're not going to be potentially running the engine dangerously rich or dangerously lean as we move into those untuned areas. What the ECU is going to do is monitor the air fuel ratio and apply a closed loop trim to get it back to where it should be. However, this doesn't mean that our fuel tuning is correct, and ideally we won't, don't want to see our closed loop trim applying much more than about a plus or minus 2% trim. This is where that quick lambda key on the keyboard comes in. Pressing that will apply the current closed loop trim into the VE or fuel table, fixing that error that we've got in our air fuel ratio. When it comes to ignition tuning, the process is essentially the same. However, this time what we're doing is taking feedback from the torque that's being displayed on our dyno screen, letting us know when we've got our ignition timing for a particular cell optimized. Of course, any time we are tuning the ignition timing in an engine, we need to be very mindful that the engine isn't suffering from knock or detonation. In order to combat this, I'm using audio knock detection equipment so that I can audibly listen to the engine and I'll be able to hear if knock occurs. At the same time, I'm using that audio knock detection equipment to help validate the closed loop knock 
control functionality inside the MoTeC M1 ECU. And this is there as a safety backstop. If, for example, the engine gets run on a bad batch of fuel with a lower octane and some knock is occurring that we weren't seeing on the dyno, that closed loop knock control is there to just pick up the pieces, retard the timing and prevent damage from occurring. In this way, the closed loop knock control strategy is a safety backstop and it's not a band-aid for doing your job properly in the first place and correctly tuning the ignition table. Once we've performed our steady state tuning, we're going to switch across and perform some ramp runs that are going to help us fill in the fuel and ignition table values and optimise those under the wide open throttle areas of the map. Here, we're using the dyno to replicate the way the engine will accelerate out on the racetrack at wide open throttle. And we can also control the rate of change of RPM, and we want to try and match this fairly accurately to the rate of change of RPM that we'll see out on the track in fourth or fifth gear when the engine is under full load. Under these conditions, understandably, there's a lot going on very quickly, and it's not feasible for us to actually make fuel and ignition changes while the engine's performing the ramp run. Instead, what we're going to do is data log everything that's occurring while the engine's running on the dyno. After the run, we're going to back off, come back down to idle, and we can then look at our data logging and decide on what changes need to be made, either to our fueling or our ignition timing. Particularly when we are starting with a freshly installed ECU and we're building up our map though, we do need to be a little bit mindful here. And instead of doing our very first run all the way out to the engine rev limiter, what we're best to do is start by taking a smaller slice of the map and maybe only running the engine between 2000 and 4000 RPM. We'll of course be monitoring the air fuel ratio and listening for knock and if at any time we're not happy with our progress, we can simply back off the throttle, abort the run, make whatever changes are necessary and then perform another run to check the effects of those changes. In this way the MoTeC M150 is also helping us during our ramp runs. Again we've got that closed loop air fuel ratio control there to make any adjustments necessary to it, get our fueling onto our target and of course we've got that closed loop knock control listening there for detonation and ready to retard the ignition timing on individual cylinders if any knock is detected. The difference, as far as the driver is concerned, with an engine that's been properly tuned like this, is that out on the road or the racetrack, the engine will feel crisper, it's going to feel more responsive, it's going to feel like it produces more part throttle power and torque, and as an added bonus, it's actually also going to deliver better fuel economy. Now, that's pretty important, particularly if you're involved in endurance racing. If you like that video, make sure you give it a thumbs up and if you're not already a subscriber, make sure you're subscribed. We release a new video every week. And if you like free stuff, we've got a great deal for you. Click the link in the description to claim your free spot to our next live lesson.